Hello and welcome to Decision NYC with Ben Max. I'm Ben Max, your host and the executive editor of Gotham Gazette. The 2021 New York City election season is underway and it's poised to be the most significant municipal election in decades. All of city government is on the ballot and because so few incumbents are eligible to run for their current seats due to term limits, New Yorkers are electing many new office holders and the next roster of leadership for our city. There will be a new mayor of New York City elected here in 2021, as well as a new city controller, new borough presidents, and many new city council members. And that's not all that's on the ballot. A number of incumbents are eligible and seeking re-election. And there's a very crowded and competitive race for Manhattan District Attorney. Party primaries are set for June and the general election in the fall will culminate on November 2nd. This is the first full set of municipal elections that will feature both early voting and ranked choice voting, a system that will apply to party primaries and special elections only, and we'll have a special show just on ranked choice voting. The city election cycle would be of enormous importance under even usual circumstances, but it is unfolding at a time of great crisis for our city, raising the stakes of the decisions that you, the voter, will make. The new wave of city leadership will, quite obviously, make or break the city's recovery from the devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on health, families, jobs, education, and more. So we're pleased to bring you this new series of interviews with the candidates running for mayor of New York City, as well as candidates for other offices. These one-on-one -on -one conversations will help you to get to know the candidates better, learn about their backgrounds and platforms, where they stand on key issues, and what their vision is for the future of this city. We hope this and other interviews will help you sort through your many choices and make an informed decision when it's time to vote. So let's get to today's conversation. Joining me now by Zoom is Carlos Menchaca, a Democratic candidate for mayor of New York City. Welcome, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Buenas tardes, Ben. Good to be here with you. So let's jump right in. A broad overview of you, your background, you know, sort of who you are uh, before coming to this race. And then, of course, we'll, we'll dig very much into why you want to be mayor and all of that. But, but how do you capture for people sort of who you are and where you come from? Yeah, thank you, Ben. Uh, I have been doing the good work in the city council for the last seven years, finishing up my second term. I am a city council member in southwest Brooklyn, representing Sunset Park and Red Hook. Uh, these communities are incredibly diverse. Uh, many of them, almost half, are foreign-born, non-English-speaking-at-home families, working families, that really taught me a lot about where I think this city needs to go, uh, because I've been listening to them uh, really with the courage that I hear on the streets of Sunset Park and Red Hook uh, demonstrated and representing that courage in the city council. Uh, I was born in El Paso, Texas, on the border town uh, in public housing with a single mom, uh, we, as seven kids, grew up uh, with a lot of a lot of need, uh, and I saw firsthand what government was able to do for for us as as a, as a family that struggled with a lot. And here in New York City, where I think so many people are coming for this uh, better life, uh, a life that can accept them for who they are and allow them to blossom, is what I'm trying to find uh, in this next chapter of the city of New York. Uh, and that's why I'm positioning myself to be the next mayor of this incredible city uh, from everything that I've learned and everything that I know is true to my heart. Um, those are the values that drive me uh, for and, and with the city of New York. What is it about um, this moment and, and your decision to say, okay, you know, my time in the city council is coming to an end. You've got a lot of options for things you could do next, offices you could run for, or obviously other things you could pursue. What made you say, I'm gonna throw my hat in the ring to be the next mayor. There's obviously a bunch of candidates who've never held elected office. So, you know, the idea of going from the city council to mayor it is unusual, but there's people who haven't been in city government at all. So, but, so not that necessarily, but what made you say, I'm, I'm throwing my hat in the ring and really going to pursue this position next? There are a few things that shape my calling for this work. Ben. And I know that you and I have talked a lot uh, and we we met on the campaign trail in 2013 when I threw my name in to run against an incumbent and was the only council member that beat an incumbent uh, in uh, 2013. And I did that because I was called to action, called to service. I saw a lot that wasn't happening 
when government responded to Sandy. Uh, and in that same way, I don't see government responding. I don't see this administration, this mayoral administration, confronting not just COVID and the budget, but immigrant experiences. Uh, the, the boroughs that are needing so much infrastructure, uh, really shaping how we think about communication and engagement with people around development. All these things are not just real, but I have felt them in my district. And I am now as mayor campaigning in every borough and seeing that the same things that, were hitting, that we were hitting in Sunset Park are alive and well in so many communities that have felt ignored. That is the one corrosive thing that I think that this city can change overnight with a new mayor. A mayor that actually engages communities and brings them to the front and center in leading the shaping of this next economy, this next development, uh, infrastructure like ULERP, all these things I think need to have community first. Uh, none of the candidates inspired me to think about that. Uh, and that's why I'm running. I'm running because these are the voices that I want to bring to the campaign. I want this, I want this mayoral campaign to reflect uh, that energy. And as people leave the city, uh, I know we're hearing that uh, companies are leaving, that people are leaving, uh, the people who are not leaving, the people who are the core and center and the spine of the city are immigrants, working families, the people who still believe what I believe, which is that the city is for them. And together, we're going to we're going to shape the city uh, in a, into a beautiful uh, what our late mayor David Dinkins called the mosaic and the promise of that mosaic. You know, you, get, you got it a little bit there in terms of how you would focus your attention and what kind of campaign you're running in terms of putting community first. But what kind of skills do you think you bring to this race and to the position of mayor if you're elected? You know, how would you describe what you're best at? There are a few things that I'm going to point to. One are ideas, the, the simple nature of, of just new ideas, new fresh face, uh, new energy that are ground, those, that energy and those ideas grounded in community. Our community, our, our community experiences are so so valid, so real, so ready to be uh, put into pilots. And let's think about the UBI, uh, Universal Basic Income Pilot, that I've been thinking a lot about. I know it was a federal, it was part, it was part of the federal conversation um, uh, for president. But when we think about how people- and Andrew Yang, yeah. His, his... Yes, yeah, he, he spoke a lot about it. And when I think about how a city can take that idea and, and run with it, uh, we've already seen that with the federal government stimulus package that came out and gave folks X amount of dollars, uh, $1,200. And we're thinking a lot about how, how that has impacted the city of New York. What I want to do is, is bring those ideas and bring them into the city of New York. Uh, that's the kind of courage. The other thing is, is courage itself. I've really confronted these larger systems like the police department and developers and and, and really with the voice of the community have really said, hey, we're not gonna go down this path of, of what people feel as destruction in neighborhoods and we're gonna change it. And so even, even uh, development projects right now, like there's a fourth avenue affordable housing project that we're looking at that's going through the Euler process. We're already seeing how the city has failed yet again to create more affordability there. Those are the things that are coming from community that need to be front and center. So new ideas, courage to say no to institutions that have never really been told no. Uh, and, and that's what I'm, that's what we need to do. And, and here's the final thing. I've been in the city council for the last seven years. I understand how it works. The city council is about to flip with new energy, new blood. You're gonna need a mayor that understands how the city council works so we can work in tandem to build that progressive agenda in the council with the mayor. And what the mayor did was fight us tooth and nail on so many issues. Uh, that some of our progressive colleagues have just given up. Well, so one of the interesting things um, that, that your answer there makes me think of is this conversation around, you know, that Mayor de Blasio, whether you're a critic of him on the left or the right, sort of philosophically, ideologically, is pretty much universally seen as not uh, strong at operationalizing his ideas. And even some of the things that people uh, on the left or the right praise him about, he hasn't executed well. What do you say to folks who, who say, okay, you've been a legislator. Uh, how do we know that you'd be able to really manage city government? How do we know that you'd be able to execute on some of these progressive ideas? So one of the things about, about government is understanding how, how it works. Uh, since 2004, I was working in city 
government working for Marty Markowitz uh, for five years. And then I worked with uh, Christine Quinn uh, and then now as a city council member. And much of that time was really working around the capital budget, understanding how it works, how agencies connect to it. Um, as a legislator, we're not just creating legislation and new, new, new ways of thinking about laws in the city. We're actually doing oversight. So you should actually know, Ben, very much that a lot of our work is oversight of agencies that are doing the work on the ground. We get intimate understanding of how agencies fail us on the ground and how we can actually reshape how they're doing it. Oftentimes it's legislation, sometimes it's a budget conversation, but we're, we're, we're hand in hand with the mayor trying to convince them to go in a different direction. Now the mayor has a lot of power. And so many times he can just say no and ignore you, uh, which is what happened around Industry City. The mayor just ignored what's happening on the ground and the kind of uh, agency impacts that could have been positive for a rezoning like Industry City that he just failed to look at. Um, the mayor was not necessarily, a, this is not an ma operational management issue. This guy had a terrible vision about how to execute ideas. And the ideas that he had were not rooted in community and therefore community rejected them. Zoning after zoning, laws that he he watered down, that forced us to water down, like the, uh, um, there's a, there's a few bills that I can I can kind of go through, but I think you get the idea that the work that, that the mayor does and did in the last five years wasn't just about, about um, operationalizing. His vision was actually just off and wrong and, and refuted the council's progressive vision uh, every single time. Say a little bit more about that. What should, what should have been different? What's the, um, you know, what's the better vision? I think you've gotten to it a little bit from what you said about you want to bring the community's voices more to the fore. Uh, can you go a little further than that in, in sort of describing yeah. the, the adjustment? Because, you know, many people in the city would say, Bill de Blasio has got a pretty progressive vision, uh, but but how would you, you know, tweak that further? Well, one, I would just tweak that, that comment. I think that a lot of what the the mayor takes credit for is what the council did. We pushed him on a lot of issues. We started, because the city council is where the policy begins. We create the policy, we, we pass the laws that he executes. And I think that's just something that he forgot along the way, um, that where, where the policy um, should come from is the people's house, the city council. Uh, and so a lot of things that were actually um, achieved were because of the council's push. Now let's talk about some of the things where he has a lot more power than say legislation and budget. Uh, let's talk about development. His entire apparatus that is the Department of City Planning and all the kind of pieces that, that kind of connect to it uh, never really allowed for communities to inject a, a kind of um, community, community driven plan. Uh, the 197A plans that communities have been building for a while now, uh, including in Sunset Park and Red Hook, never had any teeth. And so the city planning, as we learned through the ULIP process, started with developers. And so, so many of the big rezonings that the mayor pushed had had developers at the front, at the front of that. Uh, instead, the mayor should have, and I will in my administration, send organizers out to communities to really think through where we do the work that we need to do around development, workforce development. Uh, and that's where I think we can get more buy-in from communities if they were just part of the process. The second thing an idea was when the jails, this is another ULERP, the, new, the four new jails that caused so much issue. And People didn't want the new jails to happen, but he linked it to the closing of Rikers. This guy can actually close Rikers right now and rethink how, we, how, we, how, how we've been doing uh, kind of jail and corrections in the city of New York. Uh, those are the kind of moments where there was no courage and didn't really understand that the issue was changing rapidly, that we can actually not have to spend $9.2 billion on jails. And so one of the first things that I would do is essentially stop the construction of these jails, close Rikers uh, with some of the new, new jails plans that have, um, have emerged about how we transition uh, to a less carceral state. Uh, those are things that are personal to me as, a, as, the, um, as a chair of the immigration committee. Uh, and I think the other thing I wanna say is that a lot of his immigration policies were also uh, watered down. Uh, he refused to give uh, due process lawyers uh, to all immigrants that needed it if they were in a deportation proceeding, connecting them to potential kind of um, uh, criminal history uh, when I think that 
our, our kind of our, our city criminal justice system allows for everyone to have a lawyer, no matter no matter your background, no matter your immigration status, uh, and and uh, uh, and so those are the kind of things that we fought all the time. Uh, I want to get to a whole lot of other stuff, but um, just okay. to, just to follow, up, follow up quickly, um, you know, the mayor's the the mayor and the city council plan for these new jails has capacity at maybe around four thousand uh, beds, which is you know historically incredibly low uh, jail population for the city. You think it can be even lower than that, and and that new jail construction isn't needed? Just use the non-Rikers jail space that currently exists in the city. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, you're giving numbers that have been in transformation over time. Uh, a lot of the state work that has really removed removed the ability for us to incarcerate people um, is uh, is already kind of changing the the population numbers. So, I think those are going to keep going down. Um, but I think that there's another opportunity here to create infrastructure with the community um, com community based operations that keep people back home and not not in jails. Uh, the carceral state has been a terrible thing for the city of New York. And we know that that's been racist. And this is why the movement for closing Rikers has grown. And it is where it is right now. But I think that we were kind of stuck in this old frame and not allowed for some of this. Uh, and I know that the governor has been fighting some of this, uh, the bail reform and whatnot. But I think with the majority in the Senate, in the Senate we're going to be able to actually, I think, push further. One of the other quick things on this uh, is sure. that, you know, part of the rationale behind building new jails is make them more modern facilities where it's uh, easier for people who are doing, you know, and these are largely for, relatively speaking, the briefer sentences because it's not prison. Um, but we, we know, obviously, historically, people have been locked up for far longer than they should be of just awaiting trial, for example. But part of the idea was that they could be more modern facilities. It's, it's uh, you know, recreation, light, visitation from, from families, other services, legal services, you know, that, that the current jail space, even if you weren't to expand the space, that they're so antiquated that they actually create a culture of, of violence in some ways. They create, you know, more problems for people that wind up there, whether it's for a day or half a year. What do you say to that if, if, you know, if you're saying let's not build these new jails? Well, I, I think all we have to do is, is take your words and put them back when Rikers was getting built. It's the same thing that people said about Rikers. Uh, so your, your argument the, or the argument that you're proposing to, for me to respond to is the same argument that you want for every jail. Uh, and that's just not true. Uh, there's constant and, and consistent disinvestment around these, these prisons. Uh, over time, and so they may they may start um, uh, world class, and and they become what they are, which are cages, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to to uh, defend the nature of these things that I think are terrible, uh, and we can be spending a lot more money. Nine point two billion dollars is a lot of money uh, to be investing back into communities, and what we do know is that that what while, while we're we're tr we're now we're, you and I are talking about building more cages. Uh, what we're not talking about are, are, are things that communities need to remove that pipeline. And there are kids right now that are part of this prison uh, school, school to prison pipeline that don't even need to end up in, in prisons. And, and again, this is both something that happens with our city dwellers in the city of New York and other modern uh, urban spaces. But this is what happens with immigrants. These private prisons are getting created all over the country and we're sending New Yorkers to these private prisons. Uh, this has to stop. And the city of New York has to make that happen. So we, uh, we don't know a lot of what's going to happen between when we're talking through this incredibly important election year and then when a new mayor takes office in January of 2022. Um, but as, as we sit now, what need to be the, the pillars of the city's recovery from COVID-19? What are some of the things that you'll be advocating for while in the council, while on the campaign trail? And depending on whether they happen or don't happen, you know, may need to execute if you're elected mayor. But what what should be in your mind some of the pillars of this recovery? There are two things that I think are really important for the pillars of this next chapter. One are our working families. Those working families that I'm talking about that are, that are living in my district and so many parts of, of the city are staying and they're part of this essential workforce. Uh, I know that we're all talking about the, the vaccine and and 
who gets it first and is who are the essential workers and how do we communicate to them? I think if we hold all the, the kind of pieces together that say our working families need to be at the core and center of, of, of everything that we do, we're gonna be able to save the soul of this city. Uh, and this is what I've been kind of working on for a long time, working on worker cooperatives, really giving opportunities for immigrants to be able to engage uh, families a mother and a father to be able to kind of create their own business. Uh, those are the kind of things that I think are going to be important. And if we if we just hold that as a lens on how we make decisions, we're going to be able to fortify the things that are going to make the city strong. Um, and then everyone else will come. All those businesses that are threatening or actually leave the city will come back. The artist will st will will be fortified. The immigrant working families will be fortified uh, with resources. This is why the universal basic income pilot that I wanna do this year to get information about how it works can actually start supporting some of these bigger things as the economy comes back. Uh, we, um, we also have to look at the second thing, which is not just looking at people, but how we think about the budget. Uh, we, we have to rethink the budget, the austerity budget that the mayor forced us to, to look at and pass at the city council, which I voted no on, um, needs to be rethought. We need to put more resources in communities. And that means that we have to talk about removing funds from the NYPD and bringing them into communities that need it now. But let's uh, let's go back to that like in, just, in just one sec. But when you say it's an austerity budget, how do you mean? I mean, you know, the city has very limited ability to raise revenue on its own. How do you mean it was an austerity budget? It's about, it, it's about priorities. So we decided to remove social services and keep, uh, and keep a bloated NYPD budget alive. In fact, we, we just increased another 900 cops in the last few months at the end of, at the end of fall. Um, that's what we're talking about, austerity. Okay. There, were, there, were kids, there, were, there were kids that did not get summer youth employment uh, for, uh, uh, for, for many reasons, not just a defunded budget on the, on, on, for youth, uh, but so many of the things that we needed that were uh, critical to quality of life for, for people um, are still not being fully funded. And this is, this is what COVID has exacerbated. Those problems weren't, weren't new. Uh, communities like mine that I represented in Sunset Park and Red Hook were always experiencing that. Now we're just seeing that magnified because of COVID. And so, like I said, we, we have to focus on those families to ensure that they get what they need. Um, and this UBI can actually show us how people can, can, can stop their, in their, their trajectory from, from becoming homeless and actually uh, become housing secure. Those are the kind of things that I want to talk about in this campaign. If Carlos Menchaca is uh, elected mayor of New York City, you, you take the helm. How do you how do you run the police department? What are the steps that you take, both in terms of leadership of, of policing, but also, as you say, uh, you know, being a proponent of, of removing funds from the NYPD? You know, you're you're put in that position to make those plans. Some of them you can execute right away. Some of them you need to work with the city council on. But what does that look like? What's both the sort of tone you set, the leadership, the policies, and then what is you know what is your approach to the budget? I'm working on a bill right now, Ben, that would remove police from poll sites. We saw that was a disaster for a lot of different reasons. Uh, that's something that I would want to work with the city council to actually create more non-police solutions. We're talking about mental health already. The mayor put some ideas out, but police were going to be in tandem with some of these mental health mental health professionals. When we know that when police show up with their garbs and their guns, they escalate things inherently. Uh, those are the kind of things that I would want to do and spend a lot of time doing that now in this campaign, in this council. As a council member, I will have the ability to promote the ideas of removing police uh, from our communities because police don't want to be doing all these things either, and they talk about that. So part of the part of the the opportunity here is to actually listen to police officers. And I know that the PBA and the unions and some of the uh, the top brass are are moving and shaking a lot of how we're thinking about policy. But I want to talk to the rank and file. I want to talk directly to police and say how can we make your lives better, and 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 what can we do together. And so those are the kind of things that I'm going to be engaging in in this campaign. A lot of talk about how so much of the NYPD budget is personnel, like most city agencies, 35 to 36,000 uniformed uh, and, and many other civilian. Do you have an, a, a general number where you think the uniformed headcount of the NYPD should be uh, in the near future, a target? 
I don't have a sense of where that is, but it has to be significantly lower. Um, as soon as I get that, I, I think I can I can offer that to you. But I think that what 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 you're pointing to is is we got to land somewhere. We got to land somewhere. Budgets are created based on on um, on a, a kind of sense about how you want to do that. But until we really have a deep and a, a full conversation about how we we can create more non police solutions, we're not going to get that number. We just have a few more minutes, uh, un unfortunately, but um, I, I do want to get to one more topic that you raised, which is this issue of development and, and jobs and growth. And, and so, um, you know, there, I think there's people already who saw uh, how you handled Industry City and are, and are hearing you in the campaign. And there's people in communities saying, oh, that's the kind of champion we're looking for. And I think there's other people in, in real estate and business, uh, or even, you know, just some folks who are worried about the unemployment in the city and saying, oh, that guy's bad news for, for development and growth. Uh, so what, what's your response there? Yeah, I, I think that this is one of the most uh, important parts of this, this campaign is to tell the story of a community uniting with its elected officials, representing their voice, and then being able to confront some of these old school thinking around development. And what we did was we actually saved a lot of jobs on the walk, working waterfront. 14,000 jobs are still hum, humming there in Sunset Park because the speculation has now been confronted. So that's one thing, we saved jobs. Two is that industry say will continue to kind of grow and, and morph and we wanna keep working with them. So there's not there's nothing broken there. And, and three, what I wanna do is, is really kind of build off some of the community conversations that have happened around a municipal green new deal uh, here in the city of New York. Our budget is so robust that we can actually increase the, the capital budget in, in the tune of billions of dollars and bring jobs to our communities. That, that is gonna allow us to connect to the unions that are now seeing power shift to communities. Communities are holding the power. They're holding us accountable as elected officials. And so, so there, is a, there is a shift. And until people really understand that, um, they're just going to have to wait until we take leadership, until I become the mayor, and really kind of offer this whole new way of of not just restarting the the the, the economy, but but allowing for for the for the for neighborhoods that want development, communities want development. That is a misnomer when people say that we do not want development. I want development. I'm pro development. It has to be community driven. And I have, um, and we're going to talk a lot more about that, obviously, in the campaign. But in our final few seconds here. Uh, asking, asking all the candidates at this point, um, if you had a letter grade to give Mayor de Blasio in his tenure, what would it be? Ooh. <laughs> a D minus. A D minus. Okay. And lastly, um, do you have a political role model, someone that you, you try to emulate or you, you look up to in, in politics, uh, past or present? You know, I, I keep coming back to Bernie Sanders. Okay. I think uh, I kind of feel I feel him. Uh, he's someone that has has been courageous uh, in in his legislative role. Okay. And um, has made people uncomfortable, even his colleagues, uh, which I like to do. Uh, I'm going to call him out. All right. Every time I see something wrong. Okay. Very good, Carlos Menchaca. Thank you so much for the time. Thanks, Ben. All right, and thank you for watching Decision NYC with Ben Max. Key decisions for New York City voters are coming up in June and the fall. There's a lot on the line for all of us in the future of our city. I hope this conversation was helpful. I'm Ben Max. See you next time.